All right, good morning. I'm Heidi Zuckerman. I am the Nancy and Bob Magoon CEO and Director at the Aspen Art Museum, and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. So uh, we met officially just two days ago, um, but a little known fact is that the first job interview that I had in New York was um, to work at Jeff Koon's studio. <laughs> and um, when I was called back for my second interview, I come from a very conservative family, and my mom would not let me go. So, <laughs> so, um, so I'm happy to introduce today um, Jeff Koons. He was born in New York, Pennsylvania in 1955. He studied at the Maryland Institute of uh, College of Art in Baltimore and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He received his BFA from uh, in 1976, and his first solo exhibition was in 1980, and he has continuously shown in galleries, museums, and public spaces since. He has received numerous awards and honors. He lives and works in New York City and is undeniably one of the key and iconic artists of our time, defining how we understand the world in which we live. So. Well, Heidi, thank you. Uh, can I just say, uh, it's such a thrill to be here. I saw Walter in San Francisco, and he told me about uh, uh, the conference. And immediately I thought, how could you spend uh, you know, a better couple days <laughs> than just to focus on Leonardo, Leonardo? So it's such an honor to be here and with all the scholars and friends. It's really great. Great. So we have a couple of images, but we're going to have an informal conversation as well. So do you want to talk about a couple of these works first? OK, so uh, you know the first image that we're uh, looking at, uh, uh, the Virgin and Child with uh, St. Anne, uh, this is a work that I incorporated. You don't have to have a refinement in art history. You don't have to know about all the different players. You don't have to know the hierarchy, but that your own history is perfect, and whatever you would respond to. So to try to communicate this information, I needed some authority. And so uh, I incorporated the uh, Christ and the Lamb here, and I made it into a mirror. And so I needed to have some uh, art, kind of artistic authority a little bit through uh, Leonardo, and I needed some spiritual authority that people could go through this self-acceptance, to accept their own cultural history, the things that they looked at. If, if they just enjoyed the, the color blue for blue, that's all right, or different little knickknacks that they grew up with. Whatever they found beauty in and helped give a definition to themselves, it's perfect that it's about this moment forward. So uh, this is a Baroque Rococo mirror. Uh, it's, it's gilded uh, linder wood. I uh, carved this in uh, northern Italy. But if you look that uh, in the mirror there, that's uh, from the painting that we looked at. There's Christ. You can see the eye there in the top and the mouth. And uh, he's holding the lamb's ear. Um, I hope that you can see that in the, uh, the image. So can you talk? Uh, and by the way, Gayon and Stefan own this work. And uh, they've been uh, really uh, very. Uh, yeah, the step ahead, listen. Okay. So, Jeff, can you talk a little bit about your obsession with perfection, and um, in particular the surfaces of your sculptures? Uh, you know, I, I don't believe I'm a perfectionist. I believe that uh, I have a certain vision, and I feel kind of a moral responsibility to make something the best I can. And uh, in Mulder's book about uh, Steve Jobs and uh, his father talking to him about the fence and about the back side of the fence is as important as the front side. Uh, you know, the bottom of a sculpture to me is as important as the tip of the nose if it's a figure piece, a figurative piece, because you never want to let the viewer down. And the details that we care about uh, is the viewer. You care about them and you're trying to communicate to them uh, the love, the support that you have for them, the moral obligation to communicate. So, you're, so you think about the viewer when you're making the work. Do you, what do you think the role of the viewer is in interacting with your objects? Well, well first I make my works for uh, the biological kind of sensations, the feelings, the chemicals uh, that flow through the body. I like to have a stronger stolt, uh, 
you know, from uh, looking at works. That's the type of work that I look at. I look at a Titian painting or you look at Leonardo's painting. You uh, first have sensations, you have feelings, and then it leads to the development of ideas and, uh, you know, to the intellect. Uh, so I, I make my work first for myself, but then, you, you know, you want to share that with others. And so as a younger artist, I felt that I developed a sense of personal iconography that let me control and make these emotions uh, internally, and then to be able to share that with others. Let's look at this work, too. Yeah. Uh, this is another uh, a work that I incorporated into my banality show in uh, 1988. Uh, this is uh, St. John the Baptist by, by Leonardo, and I created that into a porcelain piece. And uh, uh, again, I needed spiritual authority in the exhibition to let people know that it was okay to, uh, to accept themselves, to accept their, their own past, and to just go forward from this point. So uh, St. John was there to baptize uh, in banality. Uh, the Mona Lisa, and uh, <clears throat> I incorporated uh, aspects of the Mona Lisa in several of my works over the years. Uh, if we look at the next uh, image. Uh, this is a painting called Lips. It's uh, from my Easy Fun Ethereal uh, series. This would be in the late 90s. And I always thought about this painting as being a symbol of kind of the uh, European avant-garde in the 20th century. But in the very center, you can see this hair. And it's, it's, uh, it's flowing, it uh, has a lot of movement. And it actually came from a Chanel ad. And it was a woman holding up a pair of shoes. And uh, I just removed everything, her, her face, the shoes, and I just left the hair there. And I made this uh, kind of photo montage, and I created this painting. But it always reminded me of the Mona Lisa. Uh, the reference to the hair, and if, could we just go back yes, one sorry. second? Yes, sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, but uh, so uh, with the hair, the corn is kind of a reference to like Dali, and you have the lips, it's like Man Ray. And, uh, you know, the background reminded me of, uh, again, just mild references to like the Mona Lisa, this sense of uh, great uh, pictorial uh, uh, depth. I'm going to talk about this one. Uh, yes, this is uh, another one that on first sight you may not uh, uh, think of Leonardo, but, <clears throat> yeah. but, yeah. but, uh, but this work, I, I really wanted to make a painting. Uh, this is also here in uh, Aspen, and uh, it's uh, uh, very, uh, this, yes, yeah, yeah, they're, they're the Nathansons, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's the Candors. There's so many wonderful collectors here, so I'm very uh, appreciative. And it's wonderful to have these pieces, uh, many of these works uh, here in Aspen. But uh, this work is in Aspen. It's called Elvis. But uh, I'm making a reference to Leonardo. So uh, this work it was really about uh, going from personal iconography into mass iconography. So the background behind everything is H.C. Westerman, uh, Dance of Death. And it's a print, and H.C. Westerman's a, an artist associated with Chicago, kind of the monster group, but it's personal iconography. But uh, when H.C. would make uh, drawings of himself, he would always give himself a very fine line uh, pencil mustache, and he would transform himself like into a Clark Gable character. So uh, the dance, he's hidden by um, uh, Heather Kosar here, the woman. But uh, I took a panel, The Dance of Death, and I, I made it in six versions and flipped it upside down and reversed it like a Warhol car crash or some type of uh, uh, series work. I put on uh, this image that I saw of Heather Kosar. It was from Playboy magazine. And I thought, she looks like Elvis, you know, kind of a female uh, <laughs> version of, of Elvis. And uh, then I put the, uh, the lobster on top. And so all of this seems like a, a progression of going from H.C. Westerman, really personal iconography, into Warhol, into uh, you know, uh, this image of this kind of Elvis woman, another relation uh, uh, to Warhol, but a, a Playboy-type model. 
uh, into a Hollywood uh, type situation. And having the lobster on top, we're ending up with like LHOOQ. And it's a, a Picabia Marcel Duchamp uh, scribbling on the Mona Lisa, giving her a mustache. So uh, this painting is always another reference to Leonardo for me, the Mona Lisa. So you reference Duchamp, you reference Warhol. They also have appropriated the Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you, I mean, this is, of course, the most iconic mm -hmm. painting ever. But how did you select the Mona Lisa, but the other works in your master works uh, in the Gaze? collection as yeah. well. Uh, I call it the Gazing Bowl series. Uh, I made a, a, some bags for Louis Vuitton. They call it the master collection. But, uh, but uh, the paintings are the, uh, the Gazing Bowl uh, series. And when I designed this series, I wanted to take uh, really iconic works from the past, kind of my own uh, DNA of uh, history of works that I really enjoy, of uh, making up uh, things that I like. And I, I chose different artworks. And I would put a gazing ball in front of the artwork. And I would spend a lot of time. I would photograph uh, the image, the Mona Lisa. We photographed very, very high res uh, image so that I could duplicate it. I could copy it as precisely as possible to pay homage to the artist, the intents of the artist, also the time that has taken place, uh, uh, the history uh, uh, of the work. And uh, to put a gazing ball there that would be able to also incorporate uh, the viewer and uh, reflect the, uh, the work into uh, uh, the ball. But when I thought about doing the Mona Lisa at first, I thought I can't do it. I absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm doing this Titian, I'm doing this Poussin, Van Gogh, but it's too cliched to do the Mona Lisa. But I thought, look, I'm going to make a prototype, I'll look at it. And I scaled it up, and it was like, you know, I have to do this. And it's, but it's also a way to stay tied to the history of art and to make reference to, uh, to Warhol and his use of the Mona Lisa and uh, back to Duchamp and Picabia and uh, just the, the iconic uh, uh, quality of the piece. And your version is three times bigger. Uh, you know, it is larger. But the whole um, series for me, uh, it, it's this metaphysical kind of uh, ball in front of it. And, and even here, uh, learning and knowing about, you know, about uh, having the globe on top of the, uh, uh, the chapel in Florence. I mean, the ball is fitting. Hearing about Leonardo enjoying uh, the studying of light and how light coming from dis different sources around curved surfaces. I mean, I would like to think from just sitting in and listening to some of the lectures that Leonardo would say, OK, it's all right to use it for this piece, <laughs> with the reference, just the study of the globe. Now, in the Gazing Ball series, one of the reasons I always used a, a dark blue glass blown uh, Gazing Ball is for the, uh, uh, the reference of, of just depth and uh, to the vastness of the universe. Um, in a curved surface, it's like time bends. You know, whatever's being reflected, it's not uh, the same presence of this moment. It, it affirms this moment, but at the same time, it, it feels like uh, it's a different time. But it lets us affirm ourselves and uh, be able then to go into the painting, uh, back into the time of uh, Leonardo, the Mona Lisa, and to make the humanist connections that Leonardo would be making, where some of his uh, uh, sources would be some of the connections, his interests. Let's look at another one. Uh, this is another gazing ball painting. Uh, this, of course, is uh, uh, Rubens, the tiger hunt. And uh, as we've been uh, looking and uh, we've been seeing that uh, from the, the reference that this is making is to the Battle uh, of Angari and uh, from the, the drawing that we were looking at. And so, uh, you know, Rubens is uh, referencing uh, uh, Leonardo. Uh, Leonardo, when he was making uh, uh, his Battle of Hungary, maybe he was referencing uh, Uccello, and at least looking at how to be able to uh, construct a, a battle scene. But the whole series for me is about the humanism of, of being aware of things outside the self and giving it up to things out the side, the self, finding things greater than the self. And to try to communicate to people that that's how we experience transcendence, by uh, being able to have interest, curiosity, 
and uh, love of, uh, of others. I really think that the journey of art is uh, taking you from self-acceptance to uh, the accepting of others, where you're able to accept other people. So I'm going to put this image on the screen and then have a kind of more broad conversation with you about some of the topics that you brought up. So these are some really big concepts, right? The idea of self-acceptance, um, the idea of transcendence. And um, I like to ask people why, you know, why does art matter, right? So. Uh, well, art gave me a sense of self. When I was growing up, I remember my uh, parents being very supportive to me and uh, giving me a pat on the back that I was able to do something. And that gave me a definition within the family. Up to that point, my sister, who's three years older, could always do everything better. And then from that, uh, that time, it was uh, just a vehicle that I was able to perform. I was able to learn how to make optical illusions and to, uh, to draw and, and to paint. But I never really found meaning in art until my first day of uh, art college. And I had my first art history lesson. Uh, art history lesson. And uh, at that point, my uh, art history professor uh, brought up an image of Manet's work onto the screen, started talking about it. And it, it became uh, so clear how all the humanities come together in art. And you can be involved in, in physics. You can be involved in aesthetics. You can be involved in philosophy and psychology, sociology, all these areas. And my life just opened up, and it's never closed since that moment. Uh, to be able to have a dialogue with uh, all areas in life that you find interest in. Of course, uh, Leonardo's the, uh, the epitome of this type of, uh, of renaissance uh, person, of uh, uh, opening themselves up and incorporating uh, uh, everything into uh, uh, their work and uh, where to find meaning. So what role does generosity play in your work? I think the, the first part in uh, making work, it's, uh, you know, there's a sense of selfishness because you want to uh, explore, as I mentioned about having feelings and sensations, you want to create. But uh, then you start to realize once you're able to kind of satisfy uh, those type of uh, feelings and sensations, and you start to, uh, people gather around. They enjoy, they're supportive, and then automatically you want to uh, be able to provide these type of situations, those settings, to the best of your ability uh, for them. I mean, art's brought a tremendous uh, transcendence to my life. It's given me a platform to make the things I want to do, to become uh, hopefully the best person that I can uh, be, a better uh, husband, better parent, a better individual, a better artist. And uh, you want to be able to, to share that type of a window that art has into uh, humanism, that uh, people can become and uh, reach a higher potential. So what role do you think? You've talked about your father and, and um, the furniture store and issues of display. What role do you think your own, uh, or what impact has your own role as a father had on your work? Uh, you know, I'm just going to go to my father first. Yeah. Uh, my father was an interior decorator, and he had a furniture store in York, Pennsylvania. So I was brought up that uh, objects uh, were always just displaying themselves. They were kind of just displaying their own essence, whether it was a lamp or a coffee table, a mirror, whatever it uh, uh, would be. So I tend to work with ready-made objects, and I think this comes from my uh, father's store. And my father also uh, taught me that uh, if you uh, have a vision, you can achieve anything. You can create it. And my dad would sit down to design a living room or to lay out uh, a home. He'd start with the graph paper. And there would be no detail that he really wouldn't work out in advance so that when uh, the furniture arrived and the lamps came into the house, everything was correctly proportioned. Nothing was left to guess. You know. And your own role as a father? Uh, well, you know, where I find my interest and uh, 
uh, in life is, you know, it's, it's everyday life. And uh, so interacting with my children, uh, trying to provide stimulating situations, going to different places, traveling, trying to expose, uh, uh, you know, our family, Justine and I, together to uh, interesting uh, situations, we were able to look at the world really fresh again. And it always keeps everything uh, stimulating. So this morning we talked a little bit about the idea of controversy and um, sometimes being misunderstood. So do you read criticism of your work? You know, I do, because I, I don't want to be naive. And, uh, but I learned really very uh, early on that uh, people are going to have their own perceptions. And uh, they will look at things uh, differently. I think the art world and art, looking at art, the way people respond to it, it gives a kind of a view into how open people are to the world around them. And you know, if they're closed about really exposing themselves to a painting or to a sculpture, you can imagine that they're probably relatively closed to other experiences. So, and the way you can see some people uh, will open themselves, they'll find their own personal dialogue with something, they'll find meaning in something, and find uh, a sense of possibility for the future through this uh, type of interaction. You know, some other people will just hear something and just already close down and uh, go with something. So I, I always, uh, I want to reach everyone. And I, I really believe in the, uh, the beholder's share and uh, Alois uh, Rico at the end of the 19th centuries uh, credited with kind of terming uh, what we're looking at in Leonardo's work where you know, some things are kind of unfinished, and uh, the, the viewer always ends up finishing the work of art in their own mind. And that, uh, you know, I enjoy, uh, you know, participating in that, but always trying to take the viewer to a certain vista, a certain point that I feel like, okay, I, I felt kind of a, a personal responsibility that th this was my intention. This was kind of how I perceived it. So I hope to get them there and then to let them finish that. But uh, you, you, you can't always get them there. No, we like to say that art can be for anyone, even though it's not necessarily for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yes, but uh, the world is, is there. And uh, I think that if people accept themselves, the main thing of people, you know, they shut off the world because they're, they're fearful, they have a hard time of having self-acceptance. But as soon as you accept yourself, automatically you want to go outside the self. And then you're open to the world around you, and you become stimulated uh, by it. The more open you are, the more you realize that everything that you think about, you're surrounded with everywhere. Uh, the type of relations that uh, we're looking at, that uh, uh, people are showing about Leonardo, he could uh, find within nature all of these things that interrelate uh, throughout the world. Uh, you know, that's where everything leads. And, so I, I try to practice acceptance. Uh, my work uh, tries to remove all forms of uh, judgment and hierarchy and tries to just practice uh, total acceptance. So some years ago, I was fortunate to do the executive seminar here at the Aspen Institute. And it wraps up with mapping your, your own moral compass. And um, there's a standard that's used. And, and I came up with one that I thought maybe worked a little better for me. And so the vertical axis at the top, I put transcendence, and the bottom, I put fear. And so the idea is the closer you get to transcendence, the farther you are from fear, and vice versa. Yes, uh, uh, yes I, and I think anxiety. Anxiety, uh, the removal of anxiety, if, if, you, if you don't make judgments, and you accept everything as being perfect in its own being, uh, it, it's pretty hard to have anxiety. I mean, uh, you know, because everything is there to, uh, to be used and to be incorporated. When if, but if you make judgment, you start to uh, remove uh, something where it could be at service to you that you could incorporate, but already you've created this uh, hierarchy, this distance, where it's no longer kind of at your disposal. When if you um, have complete acceptance, everything uh, is there at uh, your disposal. So you've talked, about, you've talked about anxiety before and art as a way of removing anxiety, both as a producer, but do you think it works for the viewer as well? 
you know, I think it works for everyone, that if you try to uh, remove anxiety. I mean, I would hope that uh, an artwork, when I'm pulled to an artwork, it, it helps remove my anxiety. I mean, I'm always trying to uh, remove anxiety, get to a higher level of consciousness. But the interest in something, as soon as your curiosity uh, is kind of caught, automatically oh, the framework just kind of disappears that you're focused on that. When I spoke before about this transcendence of giving it up to something, uh, curiosity is that, that you know, you, you're caught in that, everything else falls to the wayside, that uh, uh, there is a transcendence. So we had uh, Lawrence Wiener here with us this week, and he talked about the importance of awe and how there's often an absence of awe in, in our contemporary time. And I think sometimes the scale in which you work helps with that notion of awe. And I wonder if you agree. Uh, I think scale, yeah. Monumentality is a really uh, important thing. Uh, and it, it does bring about wonder and, uh, and a sense of scale. And it all is in relation to our body. Plato would say that the first thing in dealing with a work of art is scale, uh, dealing uh, with size. Um, if I think of my own work and I think of all, I'll think of Puppy. Uh, it's a large floral piece. And this is another thing that I know that in listening to some of the, uh, uh, the discussions that we had was, you know, Leonardo working for princes, artists working for uh, uh, different dukes, uh, princes that are, you know, the activity wasn't always making paintings, that you would design things for parties or for the theater. And so when I made my puppy sculpture, I felt that, you know, this is what a Renaissance artist would do. Maybe you would just make this. I thought of Louis Couture's coming uh, home, uh, you know, one day or in the morning, actually waking up and saying, look, when I come home tonight, I want to see a 40-foot high uh, topiary puppy. And, uh, and I want to see it out of 60,000 flowers. And uh, but, uh, so I, I made that piece, and I showed it for the first time in a schloss, and from a schloss in uh, Arlson that had a little bit of the feel of uh, Versailles. Uh, but uh, that piece that I hope that the viewer, uh, and I think that the viewer feels, that it really resonates about control and how important in areas of life it is to exercise control, that you can uh, be able to achieve things that you want to in life and uh, have a certain uh, security for your life. But the other uh, side, it's giving up control. And where there are places in life, such as relationships, of not exercising control. So that's really the tension within puppy, because certain flowers are 60,000 individual de uh, decisions. One color, maybe you make a flower uh, orange, another yellow, and the type of plant. But then it's in nature's hands. And certain plants are going to try to dominate this way. Other ones are going to dominate out in a different direction. So and going back to the sense of awe and uh, wonderment, I think being aware of kind of the human condition and uh, the possibilities that uh, you know, we can try to make our lives as uh, positively as possible. It's so interesting because I never thought about the role of chance in your work, because mm. uh, it seems that you know you're so you know thoughtful and methodical and systematic in the way that you create what you do. So, are, are there other instances where you <clears throat> think chance comes into your work? I think chance is in a lot of my works. In the uh, you know as I mentioned the, the gazing ball series, uh, you know if somebody's walking around the piece, you don't know what type of view that they're looking at, mm. the type of distortion mm. that. Uh, they're getting, if I make an outdoor sculpture. Uh, I'm, I'm working a lot now with uh, making sculptures that are reflective but also have gradations. And gradations are another way to play with metaphysics. You know, uh, if we look at the sky, uh, the gradations we see in the sky from a sunrise, sun, uh, sunset, whenever you have a gradation, it helps uh, reference time. But uh, these works are meant to be outdoors. And so you, know, you could have snow on it one day, and another day it could be cloudy and rain, and, or a bright sunny sky. And uh, you never know how many people are being reflected into it. So uh, you know, I love the idea of, of it being about that moment and uh, that anything can take place in it. So reflect, uh, reflectivity has been part of your work since the very earliest works. Uh, it's not for narcissism. 
And uh, that would be like usually any type of enemy, enemy of my work would say reflective surface uh, narcissism. But it's about, for me, metaphysics in that when I first made uh, some of my early mirror pieces back in the mid-70s, I put an inflatable rabbit and an inflatable flower on four glass mirrors. Two of them leaned against the wall in an angle, two flat on the floor with these inflatables sitting on them. And when I would walk around, I realized that I'm, I'm confronting that object and it's in real time, but there's a difference in the time in that reflection. And it was affirmed, the object, but I was being affirmed by my movements, the abstraction. And it was such a, a, a powerful observation that I really had to go out and drink a couple beers to come down <laughs> from the high of uh, creating some of these early uh, inflatable pieces using uh, the mirrors. Um, I believe it's for affirmation, that it affirms the viewer, it affirms the right here, right now. And from that point, you can start to time travel. You can play with metaphysics. Uh, going in the past, I love to make reference to, uh, to other artists, kind of art about art, in that it's a way to time travel and to pay homage to our forebears and everything, all the information, all the knowledge, everything that has been brought to the table to this moment for our kind of observation of, of uh, what life is and that we can put our foot uh, in the future a little bit and try to make the, you know, life a more rewarding place for our, our offspring. I think the idea of taking a moment to celebrate the surprise that you created for yourself and the success of that gesture is so important um, because it's in recording that feeling that allows you to continue pr to pursue it as part of your practice and part of your life. Mm -hmm. So you um, have also been incredibly philanthropic. You've given back a lot. Um, why for you is it important to support the arts? Uh, well, I think that uh, you know artists have generally always been uh, very philanthropic. They've been involved in their communities. Uh, uh, I think that we realize that you know uh, life really is about having an understanding of our ourself and appreciating all the people around us, and you know uh, going to this higher state of the acceptance of others, where you accept other uh, people. And so automatically, you want to be involved in the community and to be as uh, generous as possible. But, um, and I think that it's also probably comes from the world, too, that they uh, realize that they believe that an artist can just make something. And it's, it's just there. It has kind of an economic uh, value. A lot of times, there, it is a lot of cost that uh, goes into making something. Uh, I think it's just caring for the, uh, the world around you. Know? Do you live with art? Uh, I do, and uh, uh, but I don't live with my own work. I, at home, Justine and I, we have only one poster of my work in the house, and it's uh, it's stacked. It's a wooden sculpture, and it's a poster for an exhibition that took place in Amsterdam. <clears throat> but we live with um, we live with a lot of other artists' work, and uh, I wish that I had a Leonardo, but I don't. <laughs> but uh, but I have a Poussin. And uh, we have Manet and Picasso and uh, Dali, Magritte, Courbet. And so it's really been so that the children realize the, their place uh, in art, that art is completely open to them just because their father and their mother are artists, that uh, we wanted them to realize that when they think of art, they think of somebody other than their parents. They think of mom and dad when they think of us. And when you say art, you know, they'll think of Leonardo, they'll think of Magritte or Dali, uh, Picasso, Poussin, and so on. So in the car on the way over here, I was saying that uh, no one's famous at home. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. And I think that's really important. So um, I'd just like to end by asking you to talk a little bit about what you're working on now. And um, I know you're working on this gift for Paris. And mm -hmm. maybe you can talk about you know, why you want to do that. You know, I'm really thrilled. I know uh, many of us know Jane Hartley, uh, Ambassador Hartley. And I received a call from Jane. Uh, this was probably uh, maybe a little over a year ago. And uh, she told me that, uh, Jeff, I, I have this idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful that we could give a gift to the, uh, the, the citizens of Paris and the citizens of France, people 
uh, to people, you know, citizens of the United States, to directly to the uh, the citizens of France, and uh, and to uh, to do this gift in. Uh, in response to the act of terrorism that has taken place, the several acts over the last couple of years. And I told Jane, look, I, I, I would love to do this. Uh, and I have an idea already. I've had it in the back of my mind for many years. Give me three hours, and I'll, I'll send you the idea. And so I, I sent her the idea of bouquet of tulips, which is, it's a hand extremely realistic. Uh, it's not polished stainless steel. It's uh, polychromed, extremely realistic of a hand, the same uh, scale, uh, slightly larger than the Statue of Liberty's hand, but very close to the same scale. Fingers, slightly different position, but there's a bouquet of uh, tulips, balloon tulips. Again, not mirrored, but kind of soft, extremely realistic looking. And uh, it's there as an act of offering. And there's only 11. So it's not a complete set. A dozen is like an international, around the world. Everybody thinks of a, a 12 as a set. So there's always this sense of loss uh, for the victims and their families. Never be replaced. You would always look and be able to have that sense of loss. But at the same time, the optimism to move forward. And uh, it's the act of offering love and support and a continuance of uh, the best that we have as uh, humankind to move forward. So I think it's fantastic to have been able to include a conversation um, with a contemporary living, breathing artist as we're spending days talking about the genius of the past and the genius of the future. So thank you. And the present. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Such an honor. Thank you.